what's going on? Hope you guys are staying clean and sober, saying no to drugs and saying yes to life. Um, I just want to share this video with you guys of somebody I knew I was locked up with in Perry Duchene Prison. Um, just want to show you his story, his testimony, share his testimony with you, show how he got off drugs and inspire somebody to recover, getting somebody in the recovery stages. I just want to inspire others to change their life as well for the better. So um, this place I'm a, we're gonna be at really quick here. I there were days when I'd be just so high and I'd be by myself. I lived in that apartment right there, that townhome. I got in trouble for having drug paraphernalia and getting high on heroin. This one right here is where I had my first time in a police raid. Like the first time I ever did meth was back here. When I first started using heroin, I would come down here and go in these bathrooms and I would inject myself and I'd fall asleep on the toilet for a little bit. I'm just thinking I'm just like pretty much sleeping right there and someone walks in and be like, hey, are you doing all right? And you walk in and it's like this and when you walk out it's dark. You're like what just happened the last four hours? I remember the first time I ever did drugs. This was seventh grade. It wasn't marijuana or what people usually start on. Mine was Oxycontin. A kid that, he was a friend of mine, his dad had cancer, so he had all the pain pills you'd want. And he brought it to me one day and asked me if I'd do one with him. And he just said, it makes you really relax. I'm like, sure. And I don't know what it was, I just loved it. So I'd religiously be taking these Oxycontins, and then you'd start noticing, well, I don't feel it anymore. And I realized I had to start taking more. That's when I started getting in more trouble in school. I was more fluent with my mouth. We uh, started going to counseling because his counselor at the middle school, uh, he would say, uh, Raj, it's the drugs. It's drugs, it's gotta be. And I remember my parents would always be like, well, there's no way he'd, anyone would take drugs in our household. Not my son, no way. You know, but you look back at it, so damn obvious. And what we know now and what he did, just, Plain as day right right there. And then right before I turned 16, so right before my sophomore year, so when I first did heroin. Because it is an issue, and the root cause of the issue is something very innocent. It, I had my wisdom teeth pulled out, I got Vicodin, I got addicted. I couldn't afford to buy it off the street. I became addicted to heroin. That's, a, that's the story. It all started, I went to a college party in St. Cloud and I had Oxycontins with me and we were at this party. This kid came up to me and then I brought up to him about Oxycontin. And right from there, he's like, I bet I have something better than that. And me being me, I'm like, oh really? Let's find this out. And it was powdered heroin. I remember snorting it and I've never in my life felt something so euphoric and intense. And I said, how could I get more of that? And you know, everyone gets this perspective on TV about heroin, how it's homeless people injecting themselves. Well, I didn't have to inject this. I, I grew up petrified of needles. I hate them. I just hated them. Once you're around something long enough, starts, you know, start questioning yourself. Well, if everyone else is doing it, it must be good. I just got to this one point where I was pretty high, we'll call it, and, um, they were bugging me about doing it. They're like, well, are you gonna do it at all? And I said, oh, how about this? I'll do it one time and you do it for me. And, cause I didn't want to do it to myself. I couldn't watch. And I remember they put my arm on the table and I just looked away while they did it. You could feel it go up through your veins, through your arms. It like made your whole body get this warm sensation. I'd be a liar to say it's not the best feeling I've ever had in my life. But it was ever since that moment, I said, I'm doing this every time. Uh, the heroin problem in Hudson first was noticed, I suppose, by us in about 2010 when we had our first overdose death in the city. And as the years progressed, people continued to die at alarming rates for our population. We had 12 people die in the span of about three years. 
Heroin is actually very cheap to start out with. And then the high that you get from that first dose is so um, fantastic. They say that they're constantly chasing to get that, that kind of high again. It started getting to a point, especially with heroin, I got hooked on that faster than anything. And while I was sleeping, if I started coming down, it'd wake me up. And I'd have to inject myself in the middle of the night. When I first uh, knew what I was sitting in the cop shop, they called me in and the cop, and he's telling me your son's uh, on heroin. And never thought that it would be Phil, that he would be doing something like that. No matter how disappointed you are in your family member who is addicted, you need to put the disappointment aside, get them the help, find the access to the help, and be there to support them. I never realized, first of all, how much I cared about my dad or how close we were until I got in trouble a month after I graduated high school because I robbed my best friend's house, who's my neighbor. My dad was the one there the whole time. That, unfortunately, was his saving grace as he go to prison. That saved him. Otherwise, he would have been dead. Heroin in Hudson does not discriminate. It has no demographic lines. Heroin in Hudson affects as early as 14, 15, 16 years old and I've seen 50, 60 years old. It's an upper class area. Kids aren't hurting with money. It's a small enough area where everyone knows each other. I think a lot of people are influenced by each other. And well, if I see Bob right here doing it and I grew up with him, it can't be that bad. The prescription drugs hit so many people around here. You know, money can only last for so long and they start getting low on money, they'll escalate or they'll try something new. It's like once they got on heroin, they just turned into someone else, and I can relate to that because I did. I've actually participated in drug buys at the Walmart parking lot, the Dairy Queen. I could honestly probably find heroin nowadays as easy as you could find weed. Drug deals are going down in this city every day, anywhere. There were days when I'd be just so high and I'd be by myself. And I wouldn't want to go home and I wouldn't want to keep driving because I was so high. I would try to find just weird places I could inject myself. And there's a park right up here. And they have those bathrooms that you can go into. Yeah, oh, I'd sit right in here. And just have a heyday. Right I, it would be like two in the afternoon and it'd be sunny out. And by the time I'd walk out, it's dark out. And it would just be so weird. You know, I do have to say, I am very proud of Phil um, for what he's done and where he's at. I will be three and a half years off heroin coming up in September. I know that Phil is a recovering addict. I know that his dad has, they've, been, they've had kind of an up and down relationship because of Phil's addiction. His family has stayed by his side and, that, and that's crucial for someone in, in recovery. Wood Lloyd. Yeah, no. I mean, addiction stinks. It just sucks. It just, it just is so heartbreaking. Well, you just want to keep it. Uh, no, you'd want to take smaller ones and put it. It's incredibly hard to be there for that person that you love when they're, you know, they've taken your personal possessions, they've broke things, they've done things that are so disappointing and so out of the norm for the values that you have established for your family. And when you see this, you have to get past your embarrassment and help them with their addiction. I never would give up on him. We, we, we always had the hope that he would come through. <laughs> you know, him bringing me to 13 different rehab centers, all drugged up and I can't talk and it's hard to walk. It takes a pretty unique person to be able to see all that and then be able to still be positive and have faith in you and still live with you. Uh, we feel robbed of Phil's childhood. But I, I catch myself looking at those pictures of him. I don't care what he did. You know, that's you can't do anything about that now. I I want that time back. 
one yet. Yeah. I think we're in the new chapter for him. Uh, July 25th of 2012, my birthday, I saw my son for the third time in my life, and I got to hold him and pray to Sheen. Yeah, when he saw Blake, uh, he goes, Daddy, and runs to him. And I was miserable every day when I was in prison, but that day on, I was a lot happier. I think when I heard that word daddy for the first time, melting my heart, I'm like, wow. I, I couldn't comprehend it, but at the same time, I'm like, it's not all about me anymore. That's what made me keep on keeping on. You know, but I just so thankful he's here, you know. I mean, regardless if he's your father or not, just in society today, you don't find many people like that. And I can call him my dad. And that is, it's basically a way I wish I could be the father to my son.